The first trailer for Aquaman in the Lost Kingdom is here, and it's flooded with new characters, new weapons, and new grudges. So let's break down the dam and let flow everything you need to know about the next big DC movie. It's time for Rewind Theater. We pick up where the last movie left off nine months later, and we all know what takes nine months to make in Aqua Baby. That's right, Aquaman is now an Aqua Dad, presumably with Mira as the mother. Now, longtime DC fans will be triggered by the word Aqua Baby because there's an infamous comic from the 70s where little Arthur Curry Jr. is kidnapped and murdered by Black Manta, who suffocated him with oxygen because, you know, he's like a, like a fish, you know, he, and he would die with normal air. Anyways, luckily, it seems like movie Aqua Baby is amphibious and won't suffer that exact fate. But this film is all about Black Manta's quest for revenge against Aquaman, so don't be surprised if little Aqua Baby winds up in at least some sort of peril. I'm gonna kill Aquaman and destroy everything he holds dear. <laughs> On top of being a father, Aquaman is now king of Atlantis after defeating his half-brother Orm at the end of the first movie and taking the throne. We see him defending Atlantis from what looks like a mechanical water serpent or perhaps just a runaway Atlantean train. They do say a good king makes the trains swim on time. Yeah. We take a tour of Arthur's new kingdom, seeing the people of Atlantis go about their lives and watching an underwater sporting event. My guess is water polo. But as Arthur says, not everyone is a big fan of his. Burn his kingdom to ash. Inside this menacing hammerhead submarine is none other than David Kane, aka Black Manta. He wants to destroy Aquaman and everything he holds dear because he blames him for the death of his father, as seen in the first movie. Black Manta was a side villain the first time around, but now he's the main villain of the sequel. The last time we saw him, his suit was destroyed and he got his butt kicked by Aquaman. And in the post credit scene, he was rescued by Dr. Steven Shin. Manta promises to share the secrets of Atlantean technology with him in exchange for helping find Aquaman. He had a facial wound bandaged up in that scene, and now we see the resulting gnarly scar across his face. Manta says he wants to kill Aquaman's family, and we see his ship attacking Atlantis and going after Queen Atlanta. And up on the surface, Arthur finds his father's home on fire. That's the last place we saw his dad and his child, so Manta seems to be making good on his word. Then we see Manta using his giant helmet lasers to blow up some poor fish people who are just in their fish cars trying to get to work in the morning. He's hitting Arthur everywhere it hurts from all angles. IGN attended a Q&A with director James Wan, and he said, quote, in Black Manta's search to try and fix the power suit that he had in the first movie that was all banged up and destroyed, he stumbles across something much bigger. That something is this mysterious black trident, and we can see Manta is infused with its magic, giving him glowing green eyes. He was just a normal dude in the first movie, but now he has superpowers that will let him go fin to fin with Aquaman. We don't know what larger threat he'll pose to the world, but Atlanta warns he must be stopped or global meltdown is imminent. Meltdown? If his plan is to melt the ice caps, uh, he's a little too late. We're already doing that just fine ourselves. And on that note, Juan did say that this time around, he plans to use this movie to say something important about the environment. Arthur needs help to defeat Mega Manta, so he sneaks into the Atlantean desert prison with the help of a fancy new camouflage suit, which is pulled from a 1986 Aquaman comic miniseries. And he breaks his brother Orm out of prison. Juan told us that watching the two brothers attempt to work together despite the antagonism between them is what drives the whole film. He said the first movie was a romance with Arthur and Mira, and now this movie is a bromance with Arthur and Orm. Juan describes Orm as more of an anti-hero because he believes he was doing the right thing for his people in the first movie, and Arthur respects that. Arthur has the desire to build the relationship with his brother, and now he'll get the chance, even though Orm clearly does not want any part of it. Good job, little brother. High five. Do not call me brother. We see the two brothers go on a journey, and they appear to arrive in the titular Lost Kingdom, which is a wondrous jungle filled with bizarre sights like giant blue flowers and volcanoes with green smoke. 
In the first movie, we learned there was a seventh kingdom of Atlantis that was lost, but now it has been found. There's even a statue of an ancient Atlantean standing tall. Or at least it was standing tall. True king builds bridges. <laughs> we get a few tantalizing details on the origin of Black Manta's fancy new weapon, the Black Trident. Orm tells how the weapon came from the time of King Atlan, the first ruler of Atlantis, and the Black Trident was a curse upon the Seven Kingdoms. The Trident appears to give the owner control over a horde of undead mer-zombies with glowing green eyes. But who was the original owner? It appears to be some sort of undead king, which sounds a lot like the Dead King from the New 52 Aquaman comic storyline titled Death of a King. In that comic, the evil dead king is actually King Atlan, and he didn't have a black trident, but a magic staff that controlled the monsters of the trench, those horrifying sea creatures from the first film. So how does all this translate to this movie? Well, my theory is this mystery villain is a new version of the dead king who is obviously not King Atlan like in the comics, because Atlan is standing right there next to him. And instead of him waking up in the present, like in the comics, his power and control over his army is inherited by Black Manta by way of this cool new Black Trident, which was created just for the film. Basically, they're taking all the cool stuff from the Dead King story, remixing it, and giving it to Black Manta to make him a more formidable foe for Arthur. And another piece of evidence that supports this theory, the Dead King has icy powers, and that would explain all the icy imagery around the movie logo. Next, there's a flurry of action shots, one showing Mira angrily trying to punch her way through a glass window. How much do you want to bet Aqua Baby is on the other side and Black Manta is about to kidnap him? Aquaman jumps out of the water riding his trusty seahorse named Storm, who first appeared in a comic in the 60s. Hanging on with all eight arms is Topo, the fan-favorite drumming octopus from the first film. Juan said that the character's popularity prompted them to make Topo a bigger character in the sequel. Yes, give the people what they want. And on that note, we'll wrap up our breakdown of the first look at Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. Let us know anything cool that you spotted in the comments. And for more sweaty, overly detailed analysis of all the things you love, keep it locked to IGN.